Welcome to our episode that is completely dedicated to food, our favorite topic, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we decided to create a Must Try Foods Around the World episode, what you're about to hear, because we just had Bridie on as traveling as a vegan traveler. And as much as I love eating vegan and vegetarian, there are, you know, it's not available or Bridie will tell you how available it is around the world in that episode. But, you know, it reminded us of everything else delicious that we've tried on our travels, right? So I'm generally, like I said, vegetarian when I eat at home, pescatarian when I eat outside. So I don't eat meat. It could be a challenge for me finding good things or trying like the actual cuisine, even though a lot of places can be vegetarian friendly these days. You know, I still get some shame about like, oh my gosh, you don't eat meat? Like, what do you eat then? And then I just end up, they end up carb loading me like with bread and cheese. That's not what I want to do. But <laughs> um, that's a big, one big difference between Trizzy and I is that while she does eat meat, I don't. So we go around the world on these different food adventures looking for quite different things. And I'm proud of this episode because we have very, very diverse tastes and explanations here. And the like three recommendations, quote unquote, that I give out are more regional um, versus Trizzy, the differences in yours, if you want to, you know, get into yours. Yeah, it's very sp uh, specific about location and where to find a, a certain type of meal. So you guys would, uh, you guys will listen to it and hopefully get hungry like I am right now. But uh, it's funny how you get shamed about not eating meat because I get shamed about not eating seafood. Oh, I get, I get that. I've shamed you before. <laughs> back in the day, back in the day, I don't shame you anymore. <laughs> Maybe because you're just like a lost remember. cause. You're a lost cause at this point. <laughs> Ain't nobody changing my mind. Shamed is like a strong word. It's more like been like. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you know what the next thing they say is like, but you're Asian. Okay. Now that's race. Now people are just being racist. <laughs> Literally. What does that have to do with anything? Yeah. Maybe right. because especially in Chinese culture, seafood is seen as a sign of like wealth, right? Yeah. So then next they're probably like, well, are you poor? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> uh, on a similar note, at home, I am vegan vegetarian, just like Leah is. Mm -hmm. We just splurge when we go out. Biggest category on credit card spend is always food. So... <laughs> Restaurants and food and entertainment. Food, entertainment, and travel, <laughs> basically. And uh, speaking of food and drink, we got trusty coffee and tea by our sides. That's right. Um, yo, like I gave in. It's September 1st, though. I guess it counts, right? Can you guess what this is? Oh, pumpkin spice <laughs> latte. Yes, ma'am. First one of the season. As we're recording, it's September 1st. You won't hear this for another few weeks, but Leah has officially had her first one. And I literally got it to record this episode. I usually don't even drink fall so drinks funny. until October because in Southern California, it's literally 110 today and we're all sweating our cojones off and it does not feel like fall to me. But you know what? I'm manifesting it via coffee drink. Hey, man, I want my summer in L.A. still, so wait till I get back. <laughs> yeah. Girl, you do not want the 110. I'm telling you, I don't even want the 110. Unless I'm in a body of water at all times, which I'm not <laughs> right now. Do you have you have tea by your side, yeah? I do have tea. I've been sipping on it because my poor throat. But this tea is really cool. We just got it at the City Mall in Kalibo. And it's a turmeric calamansi tea so it's a powder Stop. it's supposed to act so as you know ginger tea um but it's still you know instead of ginger it's turmeric so it's still very like anti-inflammatory because i've just been beaten up <laughs> with mosquito bites and oh. my cough and everything so it's a it's a remedy so, but it's really good. But true traveler fashion, you're, you know, pushing through. Trizzy's coming at us live, live from the Philippines right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm loving it. It's It just hit midnight, so it's Friday over here while you guys are 
still yeah. Thursday over there. We're literally just starting Thursday. Literally just starting the day. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, cheers to our food episode because I know everybody's going to love this. You see how big my cheers. calamansi turmeric is? Salud. <laughs> Salud. Mabuhai. This is Leah and Trizzy, and we are two voices, two views, and two ways to adventure from anywhere. We prioritize travel in our lives, and we both travel very differently. Every other Wednesday, we drop episodes featuring the coolest travelers around the globe, local business owners, community episodes from you, and of course, us, your resident travel lovers. This is Ticket to Anywhere podcast. Watch us on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Safety Wing is the world's first international travel medical insurance developed to meet the needs of entrepreneurs and remote workers traveling or living abroad worldwide. The Safety Wing Nomad Insurance includes both travel and travel medical insurance, which includes coverage for any travel delays, lost checked bags, emergency response, and natural disasters, plus coverage and access to qualified global network of hospitals and doctors for unexpected medical problems and accidents, and any emergency medical evacuations. You can sign up for Nomad Insurance even if your trip is already happening, or sign up in advance by selecting a future start date. For only $42 per four weeks, you can be covered under Safety Wing and its Nomad Insurance. Click the link in our description for more info and to sign up. Safe travels! Here we are, separate continents. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Literally separate continents, but ready to talk about some of our must-try foods around the world. We're going to keep this pretty short and sweet, and even mine are more like cuisines and regions rather than like specific food. Mine is the first one I'm about to tell you about. So I'll start off my first food that I like cannot get over even years and years after the fact. And I will tell this. I've told this story on our Thailand episode. I've told this story on a few other food episodes. Kate and I were staying in a hostel in Bangkok near Khao San Road. And if you know Bangkok and Khao San Road, it is very it's like party party all hours of the day and the night. But in the morning, the food carts are still out and about, and we were going on a day tour, and we needed like a quick, fast breakfast. So we just start walking outside the hostel, and like a few buildings down, we come across like what looks like maybe breakfast. You know, we see like some breads and some soups, which soup is very common for breakfast in in Asia, right? And I see like some egg-looking thing. I'm like, okay, perfect. So I point to it, and it ended up being eggs and cooked pumpkin over rice. So that is one of my must-try foods, my first one that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, well, this is like, you know, Google University over here. It's called Phuk Tong Sai Kai. It's stir-fried pumpkin with egg. Sweet. Next time I go to Thailand, I'm going to try and find that. It was $1.50. Sounds weird, but I literally would eat it every day for breakfast if I lived in Thailand. <laughs> that sounds so good and so healthy. I love the fact that there's Yeah, pumpkin is good for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because it's filling too. Oh, yeah. I don't even think it had a ton of like spices or sauce. So- I mean, it could have had some sauces. I just couldn't really tell. But it didn't look very like decorated or anything. It looked very simple. I was like, man, this is mm. so good and so filling. All the carbs and uh, fiber and protein you could need to go on a day tour in Thailand. Yes. that's my fir- That's my first one I want to tell you about. Oh, damn. Thailand. You can never, never go wrong with uh, Thailand, even if it's a surprise meal that you encountered. You know, I want to add on to Thailand because this was my first time. That was my first time trying khao soy. And um, yeah, I know. Don't even get me started with how delicious that coconut soup curry is with egg noodles and fried egg noodles on top. Mm. Ooh. Yeah, it's 11 p.m. in the Philippines right now, and my stomach is just <laughs> grumbling talking about food this late at oh night. Oh, my gosh. Loving it. I want to talk about uh, Japan. I've mentioned Japan a few times before and how it's probably one of my top favorite countries. Um, hence, a lot of people like it as well as much as I do. Um, a surprise 
meal where I, I would I consider it a meal because it was basically everything I ate. I don't eat sushi. I don't like raw seafood. And um, we went into something similar to a 7-Eleven. It's called Lawson. And basically their sandwiches just saved my whole trip. I had like a chicken katsu sandwich that was amazing. They have like some sort of mayo mm. wrap in it. Uh, the best thing, apparently Anthony Bourdain vouched for this as well, was their egg salad sandwich. And I think from there, I just like completely looked at egg salad sandwich in a completely different way. Like it's more than just a simple, easy food to make. But at home nowadays, I'll try and like not use mayo. <laughs> So I'll just have the hard-boiled egg and right. crush it with some avocados and put some paprika on it, red chili pepper, make it spicy, make it zesty as well. And I'll put it in um, some nice toasty wheat bread. Definitely not the same because when, you, when you're thinking of Japanese sandwiches, they usually use white mm -hmm. bread. And it's so fluffy and it's so soft. It's nothing like Wonder Bread. It's nothing like artisanal bread or whatever that brand is it's there's something special about it yeah. and when you're walking around trying to look for pasta lubongs which is souvenirs to bring back uh mm. kit kat is the way to go they always have the most unique flavors mm -hmm. it's always like released first in different countries and then it hits america a little bit later um back then i feel like matcha kit kats was all the hype we didn't really get it, it's super accessible back in the states so i remember bringing some home and everybody was like hyped about it <laughs> so good that's yeah, so good for all you matcha lovers a matcha tea ceremony is a must when you're in japan we did a tea ceremony when we were in our kimonos we rented that for like a whole day and uh we went to one in the gion district and basically, you just watch a tea ceremony and see how they make it. They'll tell you about the certain temperature that you need to use. Once you take a sip, let it kind of sit in your mouth a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Savor the taste, savor the moment, savor the ceremony, and how long the process took to make the perfect matcha. So that was like kind of eye-opening for me because all I know about matcha was just hot water, dissolve it, put it in milk, matcha latte. That's it. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely more to it. And that's like one of the cool things about going to a different country is in learning about some of their food is that it's more than just food to keep us alive. You know, there's always a story behind it. My favorite thing about Japan was going to the Shin Yokohama Ramen Museum. And it was so dope. Because it's a ramen museum. So you go into it and it's such a vibe. It looks like a very underground night market type of thing. You pay an, a really cheap entrance fee, which came out to be about like $3 US. But then you go in, you go into these different stalls of ramen and you just pay for like a small bowl to sample everything. They have like gift shops, merch. Ooh souvenirs and everything and it's very aesthetically pleasing so um it's perfect for photos and everything like that that's my japan spiel i need to get there <laughs> okay i'm gonna move into my next must try food this is an interesting one because i feel like it's very south america specific but it's called nikkei cuisine and i'll tell you what it is and tell you what it isn't it's spelled n i k K-K-E-I cuisine. And it's basically Peruvian food in Japanese with Japanese techniques. So this is really cool coming off of your Japan, um, you know, love and praise here. So it's like Japanese culinary uh, traditions, but it has like the flavors and the spices and the tastes of Peru. It's also prevalent in the north of Chile because uh, Chile and Peru uh, border. And so I'm going to tell, I'm going to read like a little bit of history on it because people, I, I remember when I got to Peru, I was like, 
how is there like so much Nikkei cuisine here? This is this is great. Um, there's a colonial period where, um, let's see, four million Japanese immigrants uh, landed in Brazil and Peru, and Peru um, really picked up on that, uh, you know picked up on the cultures they melded it a bit because i've read that they don't want you to call it a fusion right so you can't call it a fusion i do know that in brazil i did have some of the best sushi of my life and i've heard that brazil has the largest japanese population outside of japan um because of like the immigration so it's really interesting when you go to i know you don't like seafood (laughs) but for all the seafood lovers out there like myself I was very surprised to see Peruvian food made you know into like sushi and different ceviches and different soups and um see kind of the two cuisines fuse together and complement each other as well so obviously this is not served at every single restaurant in Peru like traditional Peruvian food is like lomo saltado it's a lot of rice it's a lot of meats um, it's a lot of potatoes because there's over, you know, 3,000 different varieties of potatoes in Peru. That's like indigenous Peruvian cuisine, right? But these days, Nikkei has like a large impact. Um, that cuisine obviously has a large impact on Peru. So you'd have to go to like a Nikkei special specialty, specialty restaurant in order to get the cuisine. It's not served at every single restaurant. Maybe Nikkei dishes are... Um, But I thought it was so interesting. And obviously, I love seafood. I love sushi. So it was like the perfect combination for me. But then you get all the different like South American and Peruvian spices as well. Apparently, like the Japanese introduced like good octopus to the Peruvians as well back in the day. So I'm like, this is really cool. And some of the famous dishes, I'm just I didn't even know this. Um, I'm going to read a few of them off. But like you'll see sushi and ceviche uh, with like tropical fruits. You'll see miso soup enriched with hearts of palm or chile, Um, Peruvian sushi, which is a spicy type of sushi prepared with ahi amarillo or like Peruvian chile. Um, You'll get gilt head bream, which is fish with yuzu rice, which is a citrus fruit from, you know, the Far East and jalapeno. And um, one of the most symbolic dishes of Peruvian Nikkei is tiradito which is a marinade of ceviche cut in the style of sashimi. So I think this is interesting. Anyone that goes to even the north of Chile or Peru or places in Brazil where I don't believe it's called Nikkei because Brazil obviously speaks like Portuguese. They speak a different language. Just know that there's heavy Japanese influence in those three countries. And I encourage you to seek out trying Nikkei food and cuisine like straight from the source we do have some popping up around the u.s but you know it's americanized at the same time (laughs) did you say yuzu rice with jalapeno yeah with fish in it i know you would wouldn't like it wait so (laughs) minus the fish that sounds so good it was also like really on a budget when I got to Peru in my South America episode. Y'all should listen to One Year in South America. I'll tell you all about it there. Um, But I didn't have like, you know, the funds to go out and get fancy Nikkei food. I was just eating like the basic sushi and ceviche. So my next favorite, since I don't really do seafood, but this is what I will do. Singapore is probably one of the best places that I've been uh to eat the food there and also come back having extreme cravings every now and then and i feel as though that i haven't really found great malaysian or indonesian influenced food in america just yet but imagine if i was in bali you know, maybe it would, oh gosh, I know, Leah just got back from Bali. She will tell us all about that in another episode. But basically in Singapore, it is, like I said, Malaysian, Indian, Indonesian influenced food. One of the first meals that I had was nasi lemak, which was a rice Mm. dish with chicken. And the rice was made in coconut milk. 
and that is a game changer oh, because it's yes. like fluffy and if you love like coconut oh, yes. and some savory oh my gosh and the chicken was just like a flame broiled grilled into perfection and on the side you get like some salted peanuts the nazi lamak place that we ate at for the first meal in singapore was at coconut club so go check them out get some nazi lamak a sidebar in bali there was in ubud in the jungle there's a little chain a local chain called tuki's coconut shop which is where i was raving about the coconut butter Y'all will see that soon. <laughs> also another good choice. And we had it for breakfast, but you could have it breakfast, lunch, dinner. It's also a great snack is the Kaya Toast. And we there's several locations that you could go to get it. The chain that we went to was called Toast Box. So basically what it is, there's a Kaya Jam that you could buy separately. You could bring it back as a souvenir for other people. And... You cook a soft boiled egg, beat it up with some soy sauce in it, and then get like a bread, put the kaya toast on it, and make it into a sandwich. And then you just dip it into the soft boiled egg and soy sauce mix. And also, along with the kaya jam, is just like melted butter as well. So it's so good. When I first oh my gosh, heard about it, I was amazing. like, I don't know. Like, that sounds weird because one, I didn't know what Kaya meant, but had to see for myself. And it is a really, really good snack, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And dessert? Of course, dessert. Yes, throw that in yeah. there. Yeah, okay. Also, a big <laughs> thing in Singapore are satay, which is like uh, chicken, beef, veggies on a skewer stick very similar to taiyaki the one in japan but the skewer stick is accompanied by these it's a rice ball it's rice put into a ball but there's different ways to make it there's also raw onion on the side and any type of vegetables mm -hmm. that you want we specifically had ours at satay by the bay which is next to gardens by the bay slash marina bay sands in that area mm -hmm. and it was so good and a good drink to accompany all these meals that I am rolling out in Singapore is a soursop juice. And if you guys don't know what mm. soursop is, it's hard to describe, but it's very tangy, it's zesty, sour, um, and delicious. So imagine if you like all that flavor, you add a little bit of sweetness to it and some water, and it's very refreshing, especially in Singapore when it's a hot, humid day, which is most of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add to your, well, soursop. So in Spanish, it's called guanabana. Ooh. And I, <laughs> I'm i obsessed with it too. I obviously, it's more prevalent in like humid weather, tropical countries. So I had it. It's very popular in Colombia. And like I loved it so much. And they sell it fresh on the streets. But I loved it so much. I would literally like buy the shitty fake mix from the store, like the sugary <laughs> fake mix from the store and keep it in my apartment because I was like, what if I don't, can't find it on the street vendors? So I like would keep my own at home and every like Columbia would be like, that's gross. Just buy it fresh from the street. I'm like, but they move around and like you mm -hmm. can't find them. And I want it at home. But I'm, I love guanabana slash soursop juice oh. as well. Actually, Costco actually sells soursop. The actual fruit? No, no, no. The juice. It's soursop juice. Oh. But it's not in all Costco's. It's in certain Costco's. And I know in Seattle, they have it because my family has a jug. All right. Another big thing that a lot of people go to Singapore for as far as food is are their hawker stalls. And it's basically like a food hall, right? In America, we call it a food hall, basically. But hawker mm -hmm. stalls, there's like so many options, so many vendors in one place across the city. I'll name a few we that we tried we went to the amoy street hawker amoy is a m as in mom o y and we had a noodle story and this is basically a singaporean style ramen um you'll find cheap michelin restaurants and hawker stalls one that has both uh is called hawker chan and what they what they uh, what they make is the soya sauce chicken 
I personally like fried chicken, and this type of chicken seemed um, like steamed or boiled or something. It just wasn't my type of texture. The sauce was good, um, but it wasn't as hyped up as a lot of people would say it would mm. would hype it up to be. Um, another cheap Michelin is the pork noodles that we had at Hill Street, Taiwa. Um, that was really good. There was like some crunchy dried fish on there, but I kind of just moved it to the side. The egg noodles <laughs> was great. The crunchy pork was amazing too. And the sauce that accompanies with it, it's just bomb. And um, when we were in Chinatown, this is a good spot for everybody to go to as well. Almond paste dessert. And we got this yummy delicious on a hot, hot, humid night at Mei Hyung Yun. Um, I'll spell it out. M-A-I space H-E-O-N-G space Y-U-N. And it's just, it's very similar to bean curd. And I mentioned bean curd in our Hong Kong episode. Mm-hmm. Um but this is almond, almond paste dessert. So bomb. Same texture, same silkiness. Yum. I can't wait to get there. You've been like everywhere in Asia. I haven't. <laughs> my last category is a very, very broad category, but I have my reasons because I lived there for a year. It is literally Australian brunch. And if you think brunch in the U.S. or the Middle East or anywhere in actually Western Europe is absolute caca compared to brunch in Australia. And the reason I say this is because like Australia when it or America when it comes to brunch wants to be Australia. The reason I love and I'm talking trendy Australian brunch. I'm not talking like like kangaroo strips, like kangaroo jerky and scrambled eggs type of stuff. I'm talking about like trendy you go out to brunch with your friends mimosa brunch champagne brunch whatever but for some reason every platter of australian brunch always has minimum like eight nine plus ingredients and um i don't know if you know this but outside of greece australia has the largest greek population there's a lot of greek immigrants right there's a lot of italian immigrants in australia as well so they come fuse their cuisines over there. But I think Australia also takes a lot of like Mediterranean influences, um, a lot of Middle Eastern influences, and they apply, put that in their brunch. So frequently you'll see halloumi, which is Greek. Um, <clears throat> there's ingredients like pomegranate, halloumi, um, different types of like rubs and sprinkles. Oh, duka. Um, it's like a little like kind of like a crouton breading type of thing. Um but they're so – all the flavors are so well melded together, and I feel like it's nothing like I've tasted in the U.S. no matter how much we try. And I really do believe it's because of the number of ingredients that they put. So you have, like, flavors hitting every corner of your mouth all the time. Um I lived in Melbourne for a year. Melbourne has an incredible foodie scene. One of my favorite brunch places out there was called Neighbors. It has nothing to do with the show. Um, Another one is Higher Ground. Higher Ground is beautiful in this warehouse, but it also has – it's part of a bigger restaurant group. So they do it, you know, really well. But I have some pictures up on the screen here. I took a photo of pretty much every single brunch I had in Australia – I recently had a layover in Sydney. I went to the grounds at Alexandria, which is a massive, massive brunch spot and had the most amazing brunch with like salmon, egg, halloumi, like all kinds of greens and all kinds of flavors. And I think Australian brunch is, it's an event. That sounds bomb. I like how, well, I think it's just perfect for you because you love veggies and fruits. I think, yeah, the availability of vegetarian options is what and and how creative they get with the vegetarian options i think that's what i love about it awesome well we're gonna jump into my last favorite and it was when i was in dubai um dates what i use to make my homemade almond milk and oat milk so dates is a part of almost every meal um in dubai and when we ate there as well um it's also known as the fruit of the heavens and they typically use that fruit to break or they eat that fruit to break their fast during ramadan oh karak tea have you tried karak tea leah i haven't no i i feel like you might have told me about it but i want to hear about it again yeah so it's similar to a milk tea but it's 
cardamom that they use and it's like very flavorful so cardamom is part of the chai family and uh we Mm -hmm. got ours outside of the dubai mall which was by the burj khalifa but you could find it anywhere around the streets and even in like cafes itself um it was a different type of chai for me cardamom is not like my go-to flavor if i want something spiced kebabs oh my gosh we had the best kebabs when we went to Mm. all usted and they've been in business since 1978 so about 44 years in the game Uh, they're known for their mutton kebabs which was like lamb or sheep um i didn't try because i'm very basic with my food and and safe so we tried like the chicken kebabs and beef and that was just bomb and this place is so popular Ooh. that a lot of their celebrities, the local celebrities and international celebrities will go there. So you'll see pictures on the walls of like foodie influencer Mark Weens and a lot of like the local mm. ones too. So it's good because the veggies are fresh. And when they bring out the platter, the basmati rice has like a, a stick of butter on top of it. And it once you mix it, it just like completely melts. But I, yeah, it was so good. Uh, that place is called Al Usted, A L space U S T A D, special kebab. When we did our desert safari tour in Dubai, and basically is an all inclusive experience, you get picked up from your hotel, you get sand bashing, you get the barbecue dinner, you get a camel ride, um, you get uh, you get henna, and you get performances and stuff so the dinner that they provided there was this appetizer called the ragag bread and very similar to a crepe but more flaky and crispy and you could get it either sweet or savory we had it as a savory and it was really really good um we saw the woman making it with our own eyes too and it does not look like an easy meal to make or an easy snack to make because it's like the sticky right. dough that you put on this heated skillet you have to make the perfect circle make sure everything is not too sticky it's just like a whole chemistry science project i don't know um oh it's known for it it's you could eat it with kebabs or you could eat even eat it with nutella so depending on how you want to do it there's different ways um Also, during the safari tour, we had dates as well, and they gave us this mint tea that I probably mentioned before, but it's basically a silent tea, crushed fresh mint with sugar, and it's it's just out of this world. Yum. I've been waiting to go to to Dubai, and now I have to because I got to eat all this food that you're talking about. Yes. So despite all these yummy food that you had just listed, I know you've been to tons of countries and there's more to talk about. Do you have a last meal on earth? Mine is like so generic. I think it would either be sushi in any way, shape or form, whether it's nigiri or sashimi or ceviche (laughs) Um, and or I'm cheating like a nasi kampur from Indonesia, which is like a vegetarian mix of foods from all the different islands. I really loved Indonesian food when I was there in Bali, mm-hmm. really loved it. And I love the fact that you can have like ve- um, vegan options like tofu and tempeh to replace protein. So, um, and the sauces were next to none. So I think it would be an Indonesian dish or basically anything to do with fish but japanese style oh nice nice what about you mine i would definitely do some sort of thai cuisine um maybe like a putsi yu or a khao soy i feel like mm. i could definitely do putsi yu every day or the equivalent but spicy is the pad ki mao which is the drunken spicy noodles or any like Vietnamese cuisine, to be honest with you, because Vietnamese is great mm-hmm. with the balance of having carbs, veggies, and protein. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And light, it's generally lighter, a lot of dishes. Leah, are there any food that you 
look forward to and trying. Yes. Uh, when I was traveling South America, I met a lot of Israelis because they would do their complete their military service, a few this mandatory military service in Israel for two years. And then they'd go travel South America for like a year or two. And they would always tell me about their cuisine. I told them, I'd tell them I love fresh salads, et cetera. They're like, we have incredible salads in Israel because the climate is ideal, right? It's technically considered Middle Eastern food or like grouped in um, into Middle Eastern. Someone please fact check me if I'm wrong. I just Googled that, but I hope I'm not wrong. Um, but the availability of produce and freshness and salads um, and just all like the spices and herbs that they use. I'm really excited to hang out with my Israeli friends and eat Israeli food. Also, shakshuka is my favorite breakfast of all time, no cap. So, <laughs> and then um, second last thing for me is um, like the tapas in San Sebastian area, which borders France and Spain. I heard this is like one of the most culinarily, culinarily, I don't think that's a word, culinary rich regions on the planet because it's in like the Basque region where San Sebastian is, I believe. San Sebastian's in the Basque region. Um, but it's completely, it's it's slightly different from actual Spanish cuisine. And then it probably brings over like some French techniques and flavors too. So San Sebastian and Israel. Yum. What about you, Trizzy? Here's my type of cuisine that I look forward to. So I've tried it here in LA and it was amazing. Mercado Ethiopian food. The restaurant's mm. called Mercado, and I learned about it watching HBO's Insecure. Um, ah! they, had, they had a segment there, and I was like, you know, I, I need to try Ethiopian food because I've been hearing a lot of great things about it from my sister, like the spices. If you like spices, which I do, you would love Ethiopian food. So when she was in town, we went there. Amazing. Yum. So I'm looking forward to actually – going to Ethiopia in the future and hopefully having it there because if it's really good in LA which is located in little Ethiopia imagine how amazing it will taste in the homeland so mm -hmm. that is my thing that I look forward to trying I'll need to try it again yes let's go let's do it because one thing that I missed out on at the Mercado restaurant was their their coffee ceremony that they usually do and they, they have it in the morning. I don't drink coffee, but I am so down to check out how they uh, do like this traditional making of it. So we hope this episode of myself and Trizzy's, you know, top three foods slash cuisine slash regions in the world will inspire you to either book a flight there, right? Or, you know, try it out in your hometown because especially a lot of big cities nowadays are so diverse that they'll have like a little Ethiopia or a little Manila and you can try these amazing restaurants where wherever you live or the closest big city to you so see you out in the hawker stalls <laughs> thank you for joining us on another episode of the ticket to anywhere podcast don't forget to connect with us on instagram facebook twitter and tiktok if you love travel as much as we do Hit subscribe on our YouTube channel as well as anywhere you listen to podcasts such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Pocket Cast. Thank you all for your support so far. When you have the time, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love to hear your thoughts and feedback and it'll help others come across our episodes and hopefully be inspired to travel and adventure anywhere.